Hi, my loves. Jere Milady, girl from around the way, where we have culture, conversation, and community. And in today's video, I'm coming to you all with a reaction video to the color purple. Okay, so I saw this film. I want to say Tuesday. Here we are on a Friday, and um, yeah, I did see it on Tuesday. And I want to just get into, you know, my opinion, some um, commentary. I want to say it's a review. So if you haven't seen it yet, then spoiler alert right here because we're going to get into some things and we're going to break some things down if you haven't already stop pause stop wait a minute okay make sure you uh like and subscribe to the channel because i'm trying to get to that 10k by the end of the day baby period so um let's just hop into it right so this i'm looking at my phone with notes y'all so this film it's a two hour long film okay it has eight out of ten on rotten tomatoes um which is really good but the song opens up immediately okay so i'm like oh wow i didn't even realize that this is a musical so i haven't been watching any of the press surrounding the color purple just for a little bit of a backdrop for full context the color purple is one of my favorite favorite films okay um, and I say that in a real way, like it is truly just one of my favorites, even from a kid, even when I was afraid of certain scenes, it was just one of the things that I always really um, enjoyed watching as my family, you know, all my life I had to fight, you know, I'm black for real. They know that about me. So it's no surprise. Even in my adult life, I've read the book, Alice Walker, The Color Purple in physical form. I've listened to it on Audible. Um, I, I, I tell y'all all the time, like girl, Get your favorites, get Audible, and just listen to it. It's so good. Um, so it's one of my, it's one of the books that I feel like I know for real because I've sat with text physically. Um, you know, I talk about it, and it's just, it's just one of those pieces that are just so good. Um, if you listen to it on Audible, it's actually narrated by Alice Walker. Who is the author i feel like whenever you have a a, a piece of text or work a body of work and it's it's narrated by the actual author it's just even more okay my mommy yuppie study yeah period okay i really take this um you know seriously this is one of my favorite films and you know just just for a little bit of context and i'll share one little story I go to Edge Fitness. If you're from the Northeast area, then you probably know what Edge Fitness is. And they have like a little cinema where you, you, you can work out at. And I was getting a tour by, you know, a black guy. He was obviously new. He was a trainee, um, white guy, big muscle juice head, white walker. And he was kind of like leading the tour. So when we get, got around to the cinema, he was trying to do his little script. What's your favorite movie in the center? So he's like, what's your favorite movie? And I just looked at him, I'm like, Ugh. Really? He's like, yeah, you know, what's your favorite movie? So I'm like, The Color Purple. <laughs> and he's like, of course you're going to say that. Like, you know what I'm saying? But it was really just me being honest, yo. I really operate in transparency in real life. And it was just so funny because me and him like had this moment of like, you know, we know what we talking about. He's like, of course you're going to say that. But we have like more popular films in here. I know they're not going to play The Color Purple in the cinema at the gym. But I'm just saying that to let y'all know. This is about to be a deep dive because baby, I've done the readings. <laughs> Shout out to Audible. Anyway, let's just hop into it. The first scene that comes on is a, is a song. So immediately they're like, you know, like, girl, this is a musical. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even realize that. I haven't, again, I haven't been following any of the, um, the press or anything like this. So it was kind of like, eh, whatever. So um, they start off with core belting and theater dancing. I'm talking jazz hands. It's a whole dance company. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, you know, if you're not really into musicals, the only musical that I'm into is you can make your way to the top, round and around. Okay, if y'all know, y'all know, round and around. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, that one and Serafina is one of my favorite musicals of all times. And just so happened, Whoopi is in that as well. Serafina, girl, I'm giving it up today. <laughs> Introduced to Professor, um, not Professor McAfee, um, high school teacher Al McAfee on, um, from In Living Color. 
if y'all don't know who he is, he was a teacher, was a character. That's where I know him from. I call him Al McAfee. His name is Brian Allen Greer, I believe, and he's a pastor. I think that that's an interesting choice for casting because he doesn't really play um, serious roles. He's always very funny. So it lets me know that they're going to have some kind of comedic relief. This is me going into the film, y'all. This is literally a walkthrough. Come with me on this journey, if you will. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel because I really appreciate it. So um, we see Nettie and we see Silly. Nettie, Nettie is obviously um, played by Holly Child, which she's kind of grinding my gears with this whole pregnancy. And um, Silly is played, I'm not sure who this actor is, but what I didn't like is that they have Holly. Like she had a couple little songs, but I'm sure that could have been sang by somebody who was a brown skin girl because she was in the film. She was a brown skin girl. And it's important to have that because of how serious colorism is played in Hollywood today in real life and even back then, right? So anyway, what becomes in, she's the, she's the midwife and she is delivering um silly's baby and i just feel like whoopi i feel like from what i'm hearing she's given low energy about this film she barely even want to be there and it seemed like in her scene she barely even wanted to do that shit as far as i'm concerned and i feel like the starting off scene was very very true to the original where we are introduced to the girls we see them in the field and now she's having this baby i think that it was very mirroring of the first in the original film which somebody like me can appreciate. After Silly has her baby, we see Mr. Eddie have a little bit of interaction. This is when um, Mr. is showing interest in this very young 14 year old, 12 year old girl. She was 12 in a, in a film, 12 in a book. And she's like, oh, you know, you, you have some mighty, you know, mighty like, you know, mighty nice feet, mighty nice shoes, this, that, and he's playing the banjo. And she's kind of looking at him like, yeah, okay, so what? And it was almost as if she was a little bit smitten by him because he was charming. He was on a horse and um, he was charming. Whereas in the original text, he never really had any er interaction with her outside of asking her hand in marriage. And even the interactions that we see in the film in the original, um, Seely or not Seely, Nettie and Mister always um, had a cynical dynamic, almost as almost as if it scared you a bit. This seemed friendly. I didn't know how I didn't know how I felt about that, but almost felt a little friendly. That was weird for me. So I just felt like they set up that dynamic to be a little bit different than what it was in the in the movie and the original text. Just. It's where you act, it's where you act, it's where you act. I didn't really feel that. Another thing that I do want to talk about is the fact that in this film, I appreciate seeing more black people doing well. Okay? And what I mean by that is we see um, in the original, um, The Color Purple, it was like only like a white strip and they were shopping in their stores. But here we see it like more or less being like a black control strip and they were shopping in their stores. And... In 1907, right, um, 1920 even, like these were all considered like the reconstruction era of the United States. I feel like there's not enough attention that's happening around the reconstruction era and what it actually meant for black people. Oh, the reconstruction era apparently started in 1863 and ended in 1877. So the color purple picks up in 1907. <clears throat> So in 1907, this is, I feel like, the beginnings of Jim Crow and all of these other laws that kind of took into effect to kind of hinder black people. Because during this period, we see a lot of black people who were thriving, okay? Um, we see a wake of laws that prohibit black people um, in a very serious way. And apparently, according to Google, um, the earliest known use of the phrase Jim Crow law can be dated back to 1884 in the newspaper article summarizing congressional debate. The term appears in 1892 in the title of New York Times article about Louisiana requiring segregated railroad cars. So <clears throat> we know that there's a difference between what's actually happening in law and what's actually in practice. I think personally from this moment, we are feeling the remnants of the reconstruction era where black people, more specifically black men, had a piece of power um, in this, you know, social, economic, political climate that was 1907 and 1920. More than 
an actual black woman did. So, you know, with setting the scene of these black people thriving in these stores and doing well and this, that, and the third, up against the juxtaposition of black people working the railroads because there were some people, black people who were still enslaved and still dealing with those kind of things. But there were a certain number of black people who were well off. In this book, for the context, Mr. was well off. He had, had inherited land that was passed down generationally. He was a black that was considered to have a sort of generational wealth because after slavery was abolished, a lot of black people um, still had these skills to farm the land and um, you know till the land and do all of these things to yield a profit. Whereas some white people were just, they were just, you know, they didn't really know what to do. So a lot of us, <laughs> the black people, and I'm talking about ancestors when I say us, were skilled laborers. And they were able to um, embark a life for themselves, embark, um, you know, gain some not only social capital, but actual real physical capital for themselves and for their children. And those things kind of, you know, became a snowball effect. And then we see things like Black Wall Street happen in 1920, where white people was like, enough's enough. You feel what I'm saying? Let's cut it off at the root. Let's cut it off at the head. And that's because, you know, Black people, we were farmers, we were into masonry, we were into sewing, we were into, we had multiple skills that we were doing for free that now we could charge for. So I think that it was important to show that, yeah, I mean, black people during this time could have been doing well. More importantly, black men, because they were inheriting over land, they were inheriting um, animals, farm animals, horses and donkeys and things that could like, you know, work with the land and things of that nature. So <clears throat> the black man or black man like in that era was king in the spectrum of a very, very divided and racist society. And this is why this book had a lot of pushback even in 1985 and 1986 by the NAACP because it was showing how black men were very oppressive to black women. And that's not to say that, you know, oh, black men ain't shit, this and third because child, we know what the <laughs> I'm not saying that, okay, child. Let me not even say that in the context of this and playing because y'all know who I am and y'all know I love us for real. But <clears throat> they, the NAACP's argument in 1985 was this movie showed black people in a bad light. Okay. It was showing how men were rulers and superior over black women. It was showing how they were abusive. It was showing how they were oppressive. It was showing how, you know, they were um, even involved in um, incest, pedophilia, a couple of other things that people don't want to associate to black people, um, especially in those times and terms, because they want it to be, be perceived as elitist, right? And in 1985 and 1986, I mean, we're at the crust of like, or a little bit past the, you know, the civil rights era, but um, we're getting into the I'm black and I'm proud, but it was very much a call to um, clean up your act as black people and assimilate as much as possible and, and show your best faith and be middle class and do all of these things because we are worthy and we are human. But it doesn't negate the fact that there are these paths. There, there is a history of all of the things that were just mentioned. And I think that this movie then, even in 1985 and 1986, <clears throat> which apparently I think it came out in 1985. I don't know why I keep saying 1986. And 1985 still did what it needed to do. Okay, we still called those things to the forefront. Let's continue. Another good scene that stuck out to me was when they were in the scene in the original color purple, they were in the scene and she saw the Reverend's wife and she said her name is, um, I call her Olivia. And I, well, why you call her Olivia? I call her Olivia because her eyes are so old. It just reminds me of an old soul, Olivia. And the preacher's name was, you know, Pauline. 
and she goes on in this new film you know i think she might i know she's mine she be mine i know she might i think she might i think that it was cute that they took the the words to the original color purple that we know i think she mine i know she mine you know whatever and then attached it to a song that we can now kind of vibe to so to speak because we all know when she pulls up into the store what do you want gal and the guy was asking her and pressing her for um her order and she just was in there to see her baby i think that that was good that they did that because it was like a little homage to the to the original but still making it very fresh so one of the things that was really really good to me was when Nettie meets the kids in the house that was just so good because um, Mr. comes around and says, I want to, I want to marry a silly, um, or Nettie. He says it will never happen. And then he said, well, you'll be back because your kids are running wild. Because what people don't know if they haven't read the book, child, is that Mr. was a, I don't want to say he was a widow because that's not what it is. He was, I don't know, his wife had passed on by an ex-lover, all of this shit. He was a messy man. Okay. He was very much messy boots and everybody knew that he had a whole bunch of children by different women and they needed a mother to kind of tend to them so the father said to mister you cannot have my netty but i'll give you silly and he rejects was like I, you know i don't really want to but eventually comes back and he does take the hand of marriage you know they bargain and give her a cow and you know the whole dowry system because these things were very much a real practice in the united states i know when we only think of dowry think of uh muslim religions or islam or other countries i don't want to say third world because that's outdated but check out what i'm saying but it was very much a thing during these time frames of american history so they show up to the house the house still looked good that was really good like almost verbatim how things happened the kids came down on the steps and they was looking at the kids well what originally happened in the text was Harpo threw a rock at her and she fainted, but the kids was kind of looking like, oh, this bitch, you ain't my mama, is what they said. And it was very funny. I thought it was so good and close to not only the original, but true to text. And if you are a fan of this film, then you are a fan of how certain moments in the movie need to remain the same. Kind of like if we're gonna remake The Players Club, Diamond still has to come out and do her, you know, dance scene to uh, the R. Kelly song, okay? Period. Even if it's not an R. Kelly song, she still gotta use the belt. The DJ still gotta be looking like, you know, frazzled because that's what we all know. You get what I mean? It was very much the same. Now that um, City Celia is in the house, we see Shook Avery for the first time, and she's in a in a um, frame. They do like a picture, po like a picture moving of her in the train. Um, I think that that was really good because a lot of the black stars on that time could not just stay stationary. They could not travel freely. This is why we have things like the Green Book and everything like this. A lot of these stars during that time traveled by um, freight train and they would just move from state to state from Memphis, you know, the Chitlin Circuit, so to speak, because it was the safest way to travel in style and luxury. I thought that that was really good and accurate for, um, for historical purposes, right? You see Holly come back to the scene. Um, Holly comes back to the scene and it was a beautiful, it was a cute little solo. That's the thing that we see in the promotion. It was good for what it's worth. We all know Holly is the beautiful girl, nice gowns, beautiful gowns, you know, whatever. Then immediately after we see Mr. had tried to rape her. She had walked past him and tried to go in there and, and she was just like, he was just like, you know, you're not playing possum with me and this, that, the third. And she kind of kicked him off of her. He pulls out a shotgun and says, you better get off my property. You better get off my land. Then this is when um, Silly comes out and it's just like, uh, <clears throat> you know, get, you know, get away from her. He's like, you better, you better stand back. And um, Nettie runs off into the, um, she's just running. It was this really beautiful moment of her Holly now running with the rain falling and she's just running with like this real serious intense look on her face because one she's running for her life and she's also running for 
her survival i think that that was really kind of connecting how women during that time were just so unprotected so unloved and needed to do what they needed to do in order to survive is what i got from that she was running it was a it was a it was a almost like this shot that i have right here from chest up and she's just running with like rain just dripping on her in the middle of the night running somewhere like where are you going if, girl if you run in the middle of the night in, in the wood i don't know if y'all listen you in the south and you running in the like where is you going but it was so um symbolic to what women were going through in that time like sophia say a, a girl child not safe in a, in a family full of men period I do want to mention something about the cinematography that happened in this film. Mister was shot with a lot of low angles. So we're seeing like his boot a little bit and we're panning up to him to kind of, to kind of just describe how big he was. And that's not only just to say how much he was bigger in physical stature, but just how much he had reigned supreme as a man, right? Over these women during this time frame. Then we see Fantasia, this little moment. They have this little moment, very similar to the storyline in the original. We see Fantasia and I just feel like, okay, you know, she wanna know about the mail. Can I see the mail? Can I see, can I, can I see something with my, the mail? And he's like, you know, I, you, you know the mail right for you, da 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 And Fantasia, although she did a good job, it was something about her that I wasn't convinced that she was a battered woman. And I'm saying that, and I, listen to me y'all, I'm saying that from a very um, place of, I've watched the film multiple times, I've read the text multiple times, I listened to this text, shout out to Audible. And Celie was very much a victim of domestic violence. There was something about Fantasia or her and her inability to capture the essence of a victim in the way that Whoopi did. Drop it in the comments. Let me know if y'all following what I'm saying. There was a difference that was that was felt. Great job, beautiful gowns, beautiful voice. Okay. That's the only critique I'm gonna give, but y'all know I'm gonna give it up and I'm gonna give it up for real. And this is how I feel, period. So Sophia in the next scene, we have Sophia and Harpo showing up to um, Mr.'s little gambling house. And I think that it was very important to notice that um, Sophia shows up in the house and it was the L house. And it was just like, no women, no children, no this, no that. And, and the guy said, do you see what the sign says? He's like, yeah, no women, no children. You know, I'm picking and choosing what I wanna read. And this is the first time that we're introduced to Sophia and the dad and Sophia have, have a really good banter. The guy who played Mr. did a really good job. The guy who played, the woman who played Sophia did an excellent job. I mean, when I see her pop up on the scene, I was very floored. I mean, like she did such a phenomenal job um, that when the first time I seen her, um, you know, singing, I was just, I was truly, truly uh, blown away. I mean, undeniable. You feel her, you felt her. Her name is Danielle Brooks. Shout out to you, girl. Wow, wow, wow. What a powerhouse. Um, that's really all I have to say to that. And I think this is also too, just an homage and a nod to the women during that time who had no real place and had no real say, where black men were already targeted, already, you know, cutting down on it, cutting down. The black women had even less of a place um, in these societies. So anyway, Harpo is building the house because the dad said she can't, she's not welcome into the home. And he comes out and he's like, who told you you can build on my land? And I think this is good because a lot of people, even still black people today, a lot of y'all got houses that big mom and them left you, that grandmama and grandpapa left you and y'all don't even cultivate, y'all don't do anything with this land. And a person who comes from the Northeast where we don't really have access to these to these type of things that have inherited land don't really know um, even up here in Philly you know some of y'all got some inherited land and don't even know what not inherited land but inherited homes and we just let it go by the wayside um, <clears throat> again this is a part of what gener generational generational wealth truly is come on be so fucking for real anyway um, 
Harpo's building a house for her and they get married. You know, I feel like this was one of the times where I felt like the singing and the dancing was appropriate because the singing and the dancing felt a little bit like good and bad hair. We're talking about good and bad hair. Shout out to Spike Lee one time because Spike Lee was one of the people who was very critical of the color purple when it first came out because Steven Spielberg is this Jewish person who decided to create this film and he felt like, why is this Jewish man doing this? Um, and it got a lot of backlash. I don't even understand. I can't, you know, reiterate that enough. They were not happy at all that this film had came out. They were boycotting it. Don't you support it they were nominated um I don't want I want to say like eight ten twelve times ten ten nominations one none because of the backlash that it got um so they were in the wedding and they were singing and chucking and driving because I felt a little bit like it was Chucky and Jai because the people during this time frame it was not a lot to, to dance about it was not a lot to sing about they were really trying to establish themselves um and these are two or three generations away from sl people who were enslaved. And this is something that we've seen in the movie where he said, you know, your ancestors would be down here, you know, rolling in their grave if they knew that your whore would be sitting up in this house. Period. Anyway, the honeymoon doesn't last long. And Fantasia tells her to beat her. And she comes over and she comes and she sings her whole uh, a girl's a girl's child and safe in a family full of men. Um, I think that that was good. That was good enough. Sophia leaves. Anyway, the house is turned into a smoke joint because that's what the dad wanted originally. He said, no, well, let's call it. Let's turn it into a juke joint and let's have, and let's have Suge come to town. Suge come to jail, town and she's in her full glory. She's drunk and all. Um, there was a plague that also happened because, you know, during this time, the church was a very, very huge part of any community. Even now still, um, <laughs> the church is still a part of the community. Anyway, shit comes to town. The whole town is looking like it's a plague that's coming. And I really think that the cinematography, again, did a good job at showing the birds and how they're flying around and, and you know, just doing all of these really weird things. If you've ever lived in the South during the hurricane season, you know that that sky will open up and turn purple on your ass. And you look in there like, Jesus, <laughs> is that you? Anyway, Mr. had breakfast and he's making the breakfast for Suge to go up into the room and she's throwing it at the wall. I mean, almost very similar, very good. I just thought that that was so important to keep those, those key moments the same. And they really did. Fantasia goes down there and she does the breakfast and then we're immediately thrashed into the wash me scene. Um, Silly and Suge were lovers, okay? They were lovers for years, all right? Even after she had moved to Memphis, that's how far along the book goes into. They have been lovers for years, okay? And so I think that it, they, the director did a really good job at outlining the relationship that Seely and Shook actually had because it was bigger than just oh, this is my husband's mistress or whatever. Because Celie was in love with Suge as much as Suge was in love with her, okay? And they, they, they couldn't show that in 1985, clearly, right? That was not even a thing. And I still think that even in 2023, almost 2024, they did it in a respectful enough way that older generations can still enjoy and still consume without feeling like, oh, I ain't making it. But the girls that know, no. I appreciate that. Full stop. Then we see a scene of Suge and Albert kind of dancing in this, you know, really cute, like this my man type of thing. You see Fantasia come down and see. Um, in the book, Celie talks about how like not seeing them together was weird in a sense of that's my man. It was more or less like, why is she with him and not me? Love that. Anyway, we see the daddy come over and try to talk about him and, you know, why you got your whore in the house and, you know, she spits in the water. That was cute. Um, so Shug does her performance at the juke joint. I want to say the, the performance was meh. The vocals were meh. It was good enough. 
Um, Sophia shows up with Buster. Um, and she's like, yeah, well, not only does Buster have kids of his own, but we have, you know, we have our own baby and I want to dance. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that that was just a shout out to how progressive women were going to be moving forward. And regardless of what, um, yeah, like this is my man. We got another kid about it and that's what we're doing. You know, shout out one time for the one time. So we see Squeak who was pay played by her said, you know, that's you're my husband now. Fine by me. I don't have to dance with him. And they get into the whole brawl, the situation. I think that was cute. After the brawl situation happened, um, we see, you know, Sophia balls her fist and they get to fighting and tussling and muscling and shit like this. They take her to the movies. And I think that it was critical to talk about like how culture of a woman should was because a lot of times women were only able to see or imagine at the length and the height of whatever their husband accomplished. So if your husband right now work at McDonald's sister, you can only see past McDonald's. If your husband was only working at the farm, you can only see past the farm because there was no such thing as women doing something on their own. And the women who did were women like Suge, who were women, not even like so much like Sophia because she still attached herself to a man, but she did so in a more independent way, right? So they go to the movie theaters. What I find very interesting about the cinematography, again, another chef's kiss, was that they panned down low and then they came up high to show Fantasia and um, Taraji at, the, at a very high, low angle, like almost as if like this to show that they were at the top because things were still very much segregated at this time. Just very good because The Color Purple was not a movie about white people. It was not. There was only a handful of white people in this book and in this movie. In the movie theaters, we kind of see them do a little bit more of the... Um, lesbian interaction we kind of build a little bit more on their romantic relationship because that was a critical piece in this book y'all gotta know that okay shout out to the girls who was on the lgbtq spectrum period this was one of the works <laughs> this is the original work um anyway you know sophia was a woman who was more liberated Shook was more liberated by way of her sexual prowess over men. So men were still the center of her independence, right? Because if she's the singer, if she's this blues, you know, sexy, you know, sapphire, Jezebel type of woman, the man is still very much centralized in that story. So although she is what is considered a loose woman or independent woman, her desirability is completely based on how much she is desired by who? Men. Her being a lesbian or a woman who is on the spectrum had no bearing on her social capital, so to speak. I just think that um, it's just it's just very telling. Fantasia and Taraji, the ballad, it was it was a moment they kiss. It was more of a it was more of a kiss that we saw in the original. Um, they wake up in bed together, and this is when we start to get the letters, okay? So now we have the, the cohesive progressive of the Africa story, but Holly is still Holly. I think that that was originally how it worked in the beginning. Um, so then we see um, Miss Millie and uh, the black people, you know, she's, uh, she says, come on to, to Celie, come on with me. We're going to go to town, and we see Miss Billy. She's like, I'm the mayor's wife. You know me. All the colors love me. And she says, well, your children are so beautiful. Can they can they come work for me? Now, I think it, that it's interesting that the children are on their way to buy vanilla ice cream. And and uh, I don't know. I, a lot of people don't know this, but black people during Jim Crow could not buy vanilla ice cream. Okay? You, you just could not purchase. As a black person, you could not purchase vanilla ice cream. It had to be chocolate. And this is how we see the emergence of butter pecan and all of these, all of these different things. But... I think that it being historically incorrect that they would not have been going to the counter by this white man being served vanilla ice cream to these black boys was almost as if like, if you think you're about to get some vanilla ice cream, you're about to get in the back of this paddy wagon. To me is what it's giving. They go through the whole scene. I said, hell no. 
<laughs> okay, and we all know what that means. Miss Sophia, no! Okay, you know, Lawrence Fishburne. Anyway, I think that they did a nice little progression of the Hell No song. Um, turn, you know, when Harper wanted to be her and it was like, if that man wants to beat you, say hell no. That was really, really cute. Um, uh, Celia visits Sophia. She's very sad. She's like, you know, don't leave me in here. Um, and I think that it's interesting that if Sophia, this woman who's very liberated, very free, very independent, uh, independent thinker, if she can't be controlled by these black men, so to speak, the white men will surely come in and do their bidding and contain her in this way. This very lively, this very bodacious and vivacious woman is now a shrunken down individual in a jail cell who is asking a very timid woman, right? Because Celie was an abuse victim. She was timid. She was, a ch you know, all of these things don't leave me. Um, it's giving the message that if the black man can properly beat the life out of you, us white walkers, we will. <laughs> okay, because we will do it. We will finish the job that they started. Actually, we will finish the job that we started that they couldn't even finish, period, point blank. And I do think that when Silly walked out of that jail, she felt empowered. Anyway, Silly ends up getting caught with the letters and then immediately after, um, she gets caught with the letters. Suge is coming back to visit. She's with her new husband, Grady. And the dinner scene, it was very good. It was almost spot on. And to do right by me. Um, she did the whole thing. Did I ever ask you for anything? Did I ever ask you for anything? Not even a sorry ass hand in marriage. Period. I felt her. Fantasia did her big one. Um, when she did that, it was very good. Um, what I, what I didn't realize in the original film was the thing that she was saying to him until you do right by me in the way that it was almost as if she was channeling from the land that she had, you know, worked on and, 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 and navigated. She was conjuring, right? That's what she was doing. She was laying, okay? She was tapping into that hoodoo energy like until you do right by me as I'm planted in this land, the land that I tilled and I milled and all of these things. Everything you do will crumble. I didn't get that so much in the first scene, but the cinematography, again, stunning. Stunning, very, very well done. Um, anyway, so we see the crops are being plagued, um, which was a very real thing. I think that a lot of people don't know that during certain times of the years, um, especially during um after the reconstruction era that they were like weeble weeble bugs or whatever there were real historical facts behind these things that infiltrated the fields in the south i know that there was one of beetles which i think is what was displayed in the film um there were weeble weeble bugs i think you know they ever heard of that weebles wobble but they don't fall down that all comes from a real plague that actually happened on these plantations, y'all. So weevils usually infest grains and starches like rice, flour, pasta, and cereals. Um, so weevil infestations start outside and they may be the result of fruit trees or gardens. Um, but they also, like there was a certain time frame, I don't really know when, I'm not gonna look it up, but there were times when the crops just could not grow in the South by way of weevil infestations, which is a very real thing, and other beetle infestations, which is a very, very real thing. I think it's very interesting that I can't even find like direct information about certain times of years that were infestated, like the, the plantations were infestation. Anyway, I know that it was a 1930s, um, many crops were damaged by uh, the, the rainfall, high temperatures, high winds, and dust storms. Um, I know that the, there was a such thing called the Dust Bowl disaster, but y'all, I know that I've seen this before. I don't know exactly when, but there were an, there was an infestation of weevils and all types of beetles that really kind of cut any type of profit, any type of products where you would literally have to um, burn the field over, which is exactly what they showed. And I'm so glad they did because when I was watching it, it reminded me of something 
like that I've seen before. Like I, I know that I've seen this before. And I'm like, oh yeah, there was like an infestation so bad that they just had to kind of get rid of it, rid of this crop altogether. So it's crazy how Google pick is, picks and chooses. This is why it's important to kind of have these conversations and know the history because there's so much power in what we are so afraid of. Okay, there's power in what we are afraid of. Period, that's all I'm gonna say. Anyway, um, we finally get the sister moment. The, uh, you know, Silly leaves, Squeak leaves with her and they're going in. She was like, you scratched this song right about, right about in my head. And that was the moment for her sister. You've been on my mind, oh sister. We're too whatever, whatever the lyrics are. That was really, really cute. Um, <clears throat> we get a phone call immediately after that Silly's dad had died. The wife tells her about the land not actually owning, you know, belonging to her, that that wasn't her real biological father, that that was her stepfather. This is something that actually happened true to text. Silly had all that time had thought that she was being by her father. Turns out that was just her, her um, mother's husband. Um, the father had died long ago and she took over and gave it to him. This is just also a nod and homage to how the men always had to be in control. Okay. Anyway, um, she takes over this and she takes, she, you know, reemerges as, you know, Miss Silly Pants. You know, look who's wearing the pants. They have a quick little moment, a song about that. I thought that it was very cute because at this point we're progressing, right? And women are kind of becoming more business savvy and, you know, being allowed to have these things. We see the, you know, um, emergence of people like Madam C.J. Walker and all of these other women and Ida B. Wells, all of these other people who have gone on, women who have gone on to make a name for themselves during this time frame. And this is loosely based. Um, we, I think in a film it was called Silly's House of Incredible Pants. I think in a movie it was called like Silly's um, Miracle Pants or something because they could fit any person, any size, man or woman. Very, very good. She made it her own. Very true to text. Anyway, um, you know, Harpo thriving. We see Harpo thriving and Mr. is just being a geezer. And then he has this moment of, you know, the flashback of until you do right by me. He's in his drunken stupor. He gets a letter from immigration and he sells a piece of his land to bring um, Nettie and Celie's children back, which is very true to text. He goes to buy some pants from Celie's House of Miracle Pants. And he tries to push up on her like, sis, you're doing well for yourself. Can we da da da? And she just says, let's just be friends. Um, in the text, this is what she said as well. But she's also, at this point, a full-blown raging bull dagger. Okay, move right along. Um, Fantasia has this very, very big bollet after Mr. Leaves. And then it dawns on me, like, wow, this was a whole Broadway play. I completely forgot about it. Um, for this to be an adaptation of a Broadway play, this is why it's The Color Purple, the musical. I get it. I get it. And they did an excellent job. We have the Easter dinner that finally happens where we see the sister comes home and we see her as Sierra. Sierra sounded good. I don't care what y'all say. I didn't care for that prosthetic mold to try to mimic Holly because we all know Sierra is Sierra and Holly are Holly. But um, I hate that this, we can't say Holly. It's Haley. Holly. Like, shut the fuck up. Holly, whatever. And whatever. Cool. We see them in all white. We see them having this very huge, beautiful Easter moment. And um, we see that Mr. was invited. And it reminded me of how important Easter gatherings used to be in the black community, which most people were Baptist Christian, practicing Christians at some point. And you come in your Sundays, you come in your Easter Sundays best. That's why you're in white. And you come together and it reminded me of like how black people, we are not doing the same thing as far as tradition. We're not coming in white. We don't even want to go to Big Mama and them house. Big Mama and them pissed us off for a thousand times. We don't even want to deal with it. But it was so reminiscent of what Easter Sunday and what it meant to be in your Easter Sunday's best. In this circle, almost it was given like ring shout energy. Right? For me, um underneath this tree this beautiful tree and they were introduced to the parent you know the sister the the, the uh, sons the daughters 
her grandchildren and this very full circle moment um and honestly it was done the way that it was done i think that it was beautifully done um were there moments of shucking and jiving sure were there moments that i didn't really agree with sure but was this an important film for us to have as black people i think that we are so out of touch with our ancestors who came before us who are who were walking this land they walked it you can go up to a tree right now and touch a tree that your ancestor has touched in a very real way y'all and i think that there was something very ancestral about this film that just hits in a way um that is beyond that is beyond and i felt that in the original with the color purple with that that steven spielberg had produced and i feel it again in a different way in this new film because it has now been expounded upon in, in the in the text form um shout out to the ancestors one time shout out to the ancestors one time that's all i'm gonna say they did this they did these things they walked these lanes the women before us the men before us especially the women because i mean hello clearly um very very good very story very good storytelling very good cinematography very good um dancers and singers alike taraji did her big one she's not a singer she did amazing um fantasia although her mouth that little mouth that got on my nerve but that's okay but that's okay i think that um the ancestors are pleased with this and i do think that there is an interest of how black people lived after slavery okay in a way that we were thriving think of love lovecraft country that was one of the first shows that we've seen you know regular black people just living their lives prior to anything weird and you know during segregation and when white people were decentralized from the story in a real way so very very good very well done i love to hear what you think about it drop down in the comments this is going to be a long video long if you're here i want you to drop down in the comments just give me the eyes just give me the eyes emoji that's how i know you that's just how i know period point blank as always i'm sending you much love and much light and i will see you in the next video peace